Hello, folks. So, uh, so we're back today uh, with some differential data flow uh, programming. Actually, to be honest, uh, I take that back. We're not going to do very much differential data flow programming. We're going to do a bit more differential data flow uh, using, which uh, might, might sound a little weird. Normally, we do a lot of a lot of programming. Um, and what we're going to show off here is, is something that's slightly different, I think, and, and pretty cool, which is using differential data flow with uh, uh, multiple uh, okay, bear with me. Multiple time dimensions, uh, or multi-temporal uh, stream processing, and I'm going to try to explain what that means. Uh, you may already be familiar with bitemporal or multi-temporal data sources. These are these are data sources that have a few different notions of time in them, um, and there's a few examples. So the classic one that uh, folks uh, use a lot in the stream processing literature because it's sort of clicks for a lot of people is Star Wars, right? So Star Wars uh, is an example where the um, there's a, a notion of time experienced by the, the wa people watching the movie, right? You, me, other people who saw things either in theaters or, or at home, where the episode started uh, four, five, six, and then went one, two, three, and then seven, eight, and nine. Uh, so our, uh, you know, the, the order, let's say, in which we got to see the events of the Star Wars universe were not the same uh, as in principle as experienced by the by the characters in that uh, in that world. So uh, we, in in this case, I'm, I'm going to use we a lot here, but sort of the the users, the the people consuming, perceiving uh, the the bits of information, got to go through the the history uh, that was presented with specific time cues. You know, things happen before, after, other things um, that were that were different. They're they're out of order. And this is a massive pain point for a lot of people in stream processing, out of order data, right? Life would be great if as time moved forward for all of us, you know, we look at our watch, time goes forward, the data that arrived were exactly about uh, the same time that we, we just passed through. We, you know, we don't get things that are 10 minutes delayed. We don't get things that are um, potentially about, about the future. That can happen too, which is exciting. So, um, so we're gonna we're gonna rig something like that up in, in differential data flow. Uh, it turns out it handles all this natively, which is sort of cool. But and I have I have an example uh, that we're gonna that we're gonna walk through. Um, but uh, I have a few other examples actually. The one that works best for me at the moment, sort of topical, I suppose. Uh, and uh, you know, what's the source of frustration for a lot of people recently? Uh, is is the counting of votes in an election, right? So. Um, we, uh, people watching election returns spill in, sort of get to see time move forward. And as that happens, data sort of land, uh, you know, get, get presented to, uh, let's say, presented to Steve Kornacki, who then presents them to us. But this information, partial information, is spilling in in real time. And it's interesting to look at the results that come, come back, but it's important to understand that they are not uh, the truth necessarily at the moment. Uh, you know, hopefully each of those votes is, is correct, but we expect to get more of them, for example, in, in the future. Uh, those votes that are, that are being counted uh, in principle have their own timestamps. There's the moment at which the vote, vote occurred. And you know, what we're interested to see as time moves forward is not what the current estimate of, of all the counted votes is at midnight, uh, for example. It's, it's some point in the future where all of the votes that were cast by midnight or whatever the rules are, uh, uh, are accumulated up, and that that doesn't have to be right at midnight. Um, it uh, you know it could be some point in the future. It could even be you know farther out in the future if if we uh, are going to allow for you know votes to change or or things like that. But that's another good example of where it's really important when you have a data analysis tool to understand the difference between what do things look like to me, the user, right now, versus what does the data say about the completeness of the input up through through various times, and both of them are super interesting. Uh, yeah, well, hopefully some of you are interested by the evolution of the of the vote counts uh, over the days. Uh, but at the same time, it's also very important to know what you actually know for certain and what things might change as time time moves along. So uh, we're we're gonna sorry, there's a lot of uh, philosophical mumbo jumbo. Uh, we're going to use a very simple differential data flow program. I've got it over here on the left hand side of the screen. This is uh, the differential data flow program we're going to use. We're not going to change this at all. It's just going to sit here, and we're going to do some fun stuff with it. Well, you'll be the judge. The program is um, 
not so complicated. What we're going to do, we have, we've got a data flow here. Uh, calling it a program is pretty pretty insane. It's, it's a very simple bit of data analysis. So we're going to build a differential data flow program. It's going to have an input, just one input. I'll try to explain what this unordered means, uh, but bear with me for the moment. All right, what do we do with this one input data? Uh, well, we're going to turn it into a collection because that's what differential data flow wants, and we're just going to count it. What does that mean? So this collection is going to take some some types of records. Uh, it's going to hold on to, sorry, some types of records. And count is just going to say, for each of those records, how many times does it occur? And if you want, you can think of this. Uh, we're not really going to go deep on this example, but you could think of this as, as vote counting, for example, right? Uh, each of the things in this collection could be a vote for that thing, and we want to do a count, and we want to watch the, the totals uh, evolve. Now, to make things tractable in terms of the output, we're just going to take uh, all of those things that are in the collection and say, hmm, to keep things simple, let's just ask uh, for the counts themselves. So we might have you know, 100 different, I guess, candidates in this case, and we just want to know what are the distinct numbers of times each were were voted for. Um, and said aloud that way, that it's probably the same number, actually, probably a 1,000 uh, different numbers here. Uh, our example is going to be a lot simpler, so it's, it's not a big deal. But I just wanted to show you some non-trivial ca calculations. So we're not just looking at the data. We're going to push it through a little bit of a, of a data flow computation. And you know, we can make this more complicated if you want. I tried that, and it turned out that making it more complicated did not help understanding what's already going to be some pretty weird, complicated stuff. All right, now having just extracted the counts from here, we're going to uh, arrange the data. This is differential data flows way to say, you know, materialize this, build an index out of it, and then um, lift it out of the data flow so that we can look at it from outside the data flow. Like when we write some imperative Rust code surrounding all of this, we'll be able to sniff around in that data and actually look at its contents as the data flow uh, runs. Great. Um, so we'll, we'll do a few other things. We'll take our arrangement and we're going to attach a probe to it. This lets us know uh, whether we've gotten through certain timestamps in this computation. That's going to be important for knowing if we have correct answers or if we're still waiting for the correct answer to, to burble out. And our computation is going to return three things here. The first uh, input is a handle to the, uh, to the data collection. This is something that our imperative Rust code is going to be able to insert records into, remove records from, that sort of thing. We're going to return that arrangement trace. This is the uh, data flow agnostic handle to the arrangement that lets imperative Rust code ask questions like, hey, at time t, you know, what, what does the collection look like? Or show me your diffs, that sort of thing. And we've got this other thing here, which is a capability. And if you're familiar with timely data flow uh, at all, and you may not be, that's totally fine. This is a way to, uh, to signal to the system those times at which we may still send data into the input. So the input's a place that we can, we can send data into, but we'd like to be able to uh, hold on to potentially the ability to send data at certain times, or importantly, give up that ability to signal to the system that certain values are now potentially complete. Like once, once they shake through the system, they're done. And we'll see that uh, in our, our little, uh, little bit of demo here. So we want to hand all three of these things back up to the imperative Rust code uh, up here. And they're all going to be mutable because we're going to screw around with all of them. Uh, we do a little bit of stuff uh, down here. This is um, uh, just some bookkeeping, really. This, this trace that we returned is going to keep a lot of rich historical data for us. And we're going to give it permission to do arbitrary physical compaction. And don't sweat too much about what that means. It's just a. Uh, an ability that we're not going to require to, to pick open physical batches of, of data. All right, there's some instructions now um, about how to use this program, uh, which we're going to do this a bunch, so uh, I want to talk through this. Um, there's four commands that, that I've written to this, uh, and these four commands are going to drive, essentially drive the input data into this computation and also pilot around um, what data we're actually allowed to, to supply as input to the computation, what times we're allowed to ask uh, for answers in the output, and then uh, just asking the you know, answers to these, these particular questions. So um, let's, sorry, those, this is just me sort of describing these, these words uh, in front here. Let's actually talk about 
what each of the lines mean, where the, the main confusing thing I think is gonna be the fact that we've got these two time things. So your, your eyes are welcome to gloss over that for, uh, for the time being, but we're gonna, we're gonna need to chew on it and understand it by the end of the video. So the update command says, give me some value. Like this is a thing uh, that's gonna go into the collection. So yeah, arbitrary, it's gonna be a number because it's easiest for us to parse numbers out. But, but really this is, you know, let's say a candidate in the election or something like that. Uh, we're gonna use like 111 or 222 or 333. It's, it's not a, a thing whose numerical value is important to us. Uh, there's a change that we're gonna specify like plus one or minus one. So you know, changes in the number of, of votes, let's say. Um, you know, just occurrence of the record in the in the thing, but let's say votes just to go with this analogy. And we've got two two time things that normally in differential data flow, uh, if you, if you follow along, there'd be one there'd be time here, right? Like there's when when does this change occur at what time? And the cool thing that, that we're going to do here is we're going to use a timestamp that's a pair of times. So it's still this is still time really. Like what we're doing is that uh, we're we're saying give us this pair of times as the time. Um, where what I want you to think of is time one as being our time, like user time, let's say. So the time experienced, you know, it's, it's like Kornacki time or something like that. You know, time experienced by uh, the real world looking at, at the big board of all the numbers. And then time two is the, the data time, in some sense. This is the time as reported by the information that, that showed up. And this is stuff that, you know, totally, from our point of view, can be out of order, um, you know, might come in much slower than we expect, and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, you get uh, a day's uh, dump or so. Um, but uh, but throughout the sort of the, the narrative, at least throughout the experiment, this is going to be first first coordinate is going to be our time, user time, and second time is going to be data time. These have other names you might be familiar with. So like occasionally people refer to these as system time and event time. So in, in stream processors, that's pretty common, system time and event time. System time is when the system receives an event, and event time is the time described in the event. Right? So the system might continually be receiving data, and the events might show up saying, like, I'm an IoT measurement from just a moment ago, from five minutes ago, from tomorrow, you know, who knows what. Um, if you're into temporal databases, this is often thought of as transaction time and valid time. So transaction time speaks about the database's view of when a thing occurred, like when did someone actually put a record into the database. And valid time speaks about uh, databases take on the real world, right? Like if, if the contents of the database are meant to describe things about the real world, um, sort of outside you know, the control of the database, things that it's been told by, uh, by essentially by the data. Uh, that's the second time coordinate. So, um, so that's roughly what's gonna go on here. Um, I have collapsed down, and we can sort of scroll through if we want. Um, but let's, maybe let's not for starters. Uh, I'll collapse them down again. Uh, just a little control loop that allows us to go through, repeatedly pull lines off of uh, standard in, and look, just make sure they're one of these uh, sorts of commands that we've, that we've baked into the system. Either update, advance input, advance output, uh, or query. And do the right thing uh, attached to each of them. And, and um, uh, the specific thing that each of them need to do is not so complicated. Like I'll just give you a, a peek at, at one of them. Yeah, not so complicated, right? Let's not get too stressed about what that is just yet. But I'm not hiding you know, hundreds of lines of code. Actually, you can see sort of on the side here, there's uh, between this sort of 66 and, and the end, 125. So that's, uh, what, 60 lines of code or so. Um, yeah, and uh, again, we'll, we'll unpack this in just a moment, but for starters, this is most of the body of the code. There's some stuff down here, uh, a little lower that does, there's like, like a helper function to read integers. And there's this uh, hunk of code, which I guess is about 80 lines or so. And it is the definition of this timestamp pair. So if I have two times, time one and time two, or like user time and data time, uh, how do I how do I think of that as a timestamp? And in timely data flow, you need to provide certain uh, bits of logic if you want to be a timestamp. So we're, just, we're defining a pair here. Um, Rust has a, a pair type. It's got a two element tuple type. It doesn't implement any of these traits by default. Um, in particular, it, it uh, implements something slightly 
uh, counterproductively for us. So we just create our own new type. And this, does, this is stuff like, uh, you know, format and debug implementations and a few, you know, sort of exciting things like lattice implementations. Um, and this is really where the heart of the logic is going to be uh, in here in the timestamp definition, but you don't need to uh, get too stressed out about that. You know, it's good to unpick each of these things. The code will definitely, it's in the differential repo. You can, you can go check it out. But um, yeah, the, I mean, the main way, I guess the main intuitive thing to pull out of this is that when we have uh, times, user time, data time, pair, so you know, let's call it u1 and d1 for a particular time, t1, and we want to compare it to some other time, t2, that might be u2, d2. We would say that t1 comes before t2 if u1 is before u2 and d1 is before d2. So that might take times t1 and say t1 is less than, or it comes before t2, or maybe t2 comes before t1, or maybe neither, right? So maybe uh, they can't be compared, or you, know, you try to compare them and it comes back and says, no, they're not, there's not, they're not an ordering uh, between those two. And that's totally fine. Um, that's not illegal or anything like that. It just means that uh, we don't you know, have the ability to, to relate those two things. And that's you know, not necessarily, uh, uh, I mean, it's counterintuitive, I agree, but, but it's not the end of the world. All right, um, so what I think I'll do is, is talk you through each of these little bits of logic right now. And again, this is a little bit surprising because we're not typing the code. I'm not gonna, we're not debugging anything like that, hopefully. <laughs> uh, we'll see. But uh, instead, I'm just sort of walking you through some stuff that goes on here. So we've got these four, uh, four verbs, update, query, advance input, and advance output. And I think I'll do them in that order because uh, it sort of unpacks the complexity maybe in the, uh, in the right order. So update here, let's get that out of the way. Uh, update is not so complicated. Uh, update is this command that takes a value, the two dimensions of time at which we want the change to happen, and then whatever change it is we want to do. Yeah, plus ones, minus ones. So we're going to read, you know, for all these commands, we're going to pick out the, uh, the verb at the beginning, and then everything else is going to be an integer. So we're going to read some integers out and make sure we have the right, the right number of them. And you can sort of see here what's going on. So this first line, we're just forming this new timestamp that we're going to try to do things at. So we take the second and third coordinate there of, of our, our arguments, make a time out of them. And uh, we're going to do a little bit of, of testing here to make sure. We're going to check and make sure that the capability that we're holding on to, right, this is our permission to send data at a certain time, that's less or equal to, uh, to this time, because if it's not, you know, we should complain, tell people, take a hike. Um, but you know, if, it, if it's all good, then we just grab our, our handle on the input, create a new session using our capability, and provide the, um, the triple, differential data flow triple of data, time, and diff, where the data is, uh, you know, the first argument, the diff is the last one, and time is now this weird pair of things. But, you know, we just shove it into the data flow. Thing. And this is, by the way, this is the first time, you know, we sort of scroll up here, eh, we, we haven't mentioned that pair stuff at all. I suppose we, we sorry, it's not technically true, we've mentioned it up, up here. But we don't need to, when looking at this data flow, talk at all about what timestamp type we're using, which is actually really cool. Uh, it means that uh, these differential data flow computations, you can decide, having written the computation, uh, what time, what nature of times it should be should be used for. Uh, they generalize over all of them, which is really handy. We're not going to need to write any special logic for these multi-temporal uh, uses of differential data flow. It's just all baked into the system. All right, so that's, that's update. We just you know, shove a new record into the stream and uh, sort of walk away at that point. You can call update a bunch of times if you want to make a bunch of changes. Uh, this is not particularly ergonomic interface, but that's uh, just how it is. All right, um, querying, right? You query at a particular time, and this is maybe one of the one of the wordier ones. So uh, when you query at a particular time, okay, there's there's some complexity here. I I maybe should have uh, avoided. Uh, so when you query at a particular time, we'll we'll form the timestamp first up. So we'll say uh, you know you've asked based on these two arguments, you've asked for this particular query time. We need to check a few things to make sure that this is a legit time and that we shouldn't tell you to to buzz off. 
For example, we should look at the capability that we're holding for our input data and make sure that your time um, is not uh, that time or beyond, because if it is, we don't know what the correct answer is yet. Like you know, people could still be changing the input data, and that's not going to uh, it's not going to be appropriate to to answer there. You might say, and it's totally legit, like why not show me what we know so far? And we're absolutely going to do that. that that's what these um, uh, this multi-temporal stuff is going to be used for is showing you either speculative or uh, sort of incomplete information. But in the context of differential data flow, we need the time to be done. And uh, bear with me and we'll see how that's not actually a problem when we want to look at partial or incomplete data. Um, there's another test over here that is a little less obvious. And this is that this trace, which is holding on to the data, the arranged data, uh, has a property. It's essentially like, what are you allowed to look at in it? Um, so the, the trace uh, will have some characteristics that will allow it to uh, garbage collect up its state and uh, avoid keeping arbitrary historical data. And when you ask a question, we need to make sure that you're not asking about something so far in the past that we've rolled up all of that information into a more recent sort of snapshot or something like that. Uh, we'll see how we control that. And you, know, you don't ever have to roll anything up if you don't want to, but your memory might grow uh, without bound. But we're going to test that. We're going to make sure that this is an appropriate uh, time for you to actually go and get a correct answer. Like, you know, we had the data at some point. Do we still have it? Mm, not sure, but this, this is the check to do that. And then uh, all of this stuff down here is pretty standard business where we walk through the trace and just accumulate things up based on the query time. So we'll walk through each of the keys, we'll walk through each of the values in the keys, and then we'll look at a whole bunch of diffs and compare the time of the diff and the trace to the query time and accumulate up any changes that are uh, less or equal to that query time. And that sort of gives us a snapshot of, at that query time, what does our collection look like? And we're just going to print out uh, you know, for each of the different uh, keys that we see. Turns out there's no values in this collection. And we still got to walk through them, but it, there's only ever one, basically, and it's, it's the empty tuple. Um, and that's it. So this is, this is reporting uh, the contents of the collection at a particular query time. Uh, you know, useful code to have to have around, um, but not uh, not too surprising if you're if you had to write this. This is what you type basically. So that's looking at the data, um, and there's two other things that we can do. We can advance the input, and we can advance the output. Uh, and advancing the inputs is maybe the more natural one for me, at least. Um, this is the one that we peaked at before. And advancing the input is where we tell the system, you know what, we're willing to give up the ability to send data at arbitrary times, let's pick uh, a new user comma data time uh, from which we will send changes. Where this, this can only go forward, right? If, if we've promised that we're gonna send things from uh, some timestamp u comma d, we can't in the future then try to walk that back and say, oh, change, change my mind, we're gonna do, we're gonna do something else. Um, this is a you know an irrevocable downgrade of um, of your capabilities. So, uh, you know, what goes on here is we, again, we pick out the times. We make sure to check that you're downgrading to a legit time. If we didn't check this, uh, the code would just panic if you called it with bad data. Um, so, you know, we don't want to do that. We just rather tell you you screwed up. Uh, helpfully, I, I think, uh, it also tells us what the current capability is. So this is also just a good way to ask, you know, if you, if you put in zero, zero, for example, in there, that sort of asks, what do we actually have uh, uh, open for our input? Um, but yeah, if, if it is uh, appropriate, so if, if the time we're asking to downgrade our capability to is in the future of the current capability, we'll go and downgrade it. And actually, then we will uh, we'll just run the workers for a little bit. So if, as soon as we downgrade this capability, we know that some times are potentially done. And until the output says, yeah, I'm, I'm also at this new time, we should just keep running the workers. So we should just keep keep moving forward um, so that you know we get all the work done that we know is now ready to be done. You might do things differently in a you know sort of more realistic deployment or something like that. This is just meant to be an interactive little shell that we can play around with these multiple time dimensions. All right. And advancing the output is sort of the opposite end of this. This is uh, in, in our output in this trace, we have permission to look at certain times. Um, 
and what we do here is we give up the ability to look at some historical times. So as you know, time moves forward, for example, your, your bank account has some amount of money in it. And as time moves forward, you know, we, hopefully the balance is correct. Um, and you might be able to ask your bank, hey, could you show me you know, for the past month my transaction history? So like that bank might say yes. Um, you could also ask the bank, hey, could you show me 20 years ago what my transaction history is? And the bank might come back and say, look, I'm sorry, we don't have that. You know, we, uh, we only give you uh, what, you know, past month or sometimes like seven years because that's for tax reporting reasons. But, but there's some history that you're actually allowed to, to observe. And uh, the fact that you can't see past that history doesn't mean the numbers are currently incorrect, right? They, they've been rolled up to the correct total. But the historical detail has been lost from you know, months or years back or something like that. Uh, so this is another you know, exciting thing to be able to do. Uh, it's exciting uh, not so much because you learn new information, but because your computer doesn't have to run out of memory as, uh, as time goes on. The same reason that you know, things like banks do this is they don't want to have to keep track of your full history or be responsible for it. And uh, this, this is essentially an important uh, part of making this be a real thing that just doesn't retain 100% of all of the things you've ever done with the system and force us to scrub through them uh, anytime you ask a question. All right, so those are the four things that we can do. And I have uh, a little little script to sort of walk through or like just sort of show off some of the cute ways that you can use these things and how you might interpret them, right? Like a lot of, I mean, maybe you believe me, maybe you don't. That you could just type a bunch of these things. They work, they produce output. Why, why in the world would you want to do that? I'm going to try to like tell a little story about um, using, using multi-temporal stuff and what it means and... Well, anyhow, yeah, we'll we'll see. Sorry, it's not a very good story. Like, uh, there's no drama or main characters or uh, um, denouement or anything like that. All right, so uh, we've got these uh, these commands here. We've got uh, two different time dimensions again, like user time and data time, or how I'm going to think about them. So the the first coordinate is going to be user time. It's our relative time thing. That's it's going to go up as we use the system. So all of our examples. This time is going to go up as we uh, screw around with, with input data. Um, the data time yeah, might go up, might not go up. So like we, you know, it might be keeping up with us uh, as we move forward, the users move forward. The data might keep up with user time, or it might not. And we'll sort of that will you'll see wobble around a little bit, uh, and that's fine. Um, so uh, I'm going to start. Uh, over here, you can see there's just some sort of pre-baked commands, and I'm just going to talk through what's going on here. So we're going to start by th tossing in five symbols. I mean, they're integers, uh, but uh, we're going to think of these just as, you know, the, their numerical value is not important. They're, they're different or the same. Okay, look, they're all different in this case. And everyone's getting a, a nice plus one. So uh, we're going to feed that into our, into our data flow. Let's just actually do this like this. Um, boop. All right, they're all present now. Good for us. Um, and we might want to ask a question, like, hey, tell me what the answer looks like. So if, if you recall, we were asking how many people had, uh, for, for each count, uh, how many different symbols had that count. So you can sort of see that there are five folks who each have a count of one. We'd like to see that answer. Oops, we cannot. All right. So we tried to ask about time zero, zero. Um, and we're getting yelled at because uh, it's still open, right? We could still uh, we could supply arbitrary changes still because we've made no statements restricting our ability to change the data arbitrarily. And um, you're seeing some pretty horrible negative numbers here. That's because we're using signed integers for the uh, for the timestamp type, and that's the smallest timestamp that exists with these signed integers. Well. Uh, you might have been hopeful and said, like, why can't we see the current uh, the current numbers? And uh, this is where the multi-temporal stuff starts to come in, which is pretty cool, which is that we can say, you know what? Fair enough. We're not going to supply arbitrary changes anymore to our input. We're going to advance the first coordinate of our timestamp. So we're going to essentially let one moment pass for us, the users. Uh, and we do that by ta -da, advancing the input. At which point we can now ask this question. Okay. 
So at you know, ha having advanced the input to one comma zero, we can now ask well uh, that zero zero time, which is you know, no longer in the future, that's locked down, right? Like we we know what the answer is there, and indeed, yeah, we go through and we we get back a report that let's see right here that there are five values with a currents count one, and you know like you could have something more sophisticated if you're trying to you know, predict the outcome of the elections or something something crazy like that. So that's good. So this is um, uh, not too uh, not too terrible, right? Like um, we're getting to see speculative takes on these the, the current totals. You might notice that we didn't advance the second coordinate, so we've left ourselves the ability of sending things at data time zero in the future. Like we don't actually have a promise that the data won't change at zero in the future. Um, you know, we might get that promise uh, at some point in the course of the program, but at the moment, things could still change at zero. But they're not gonna at the moment. Uh, we're just gonna make some more changes. We're basically gonna put some, some history uh, into there so that we can ask a few different things about it. So these are changes happening at one comma one now. So, you know, our time has moved forward. We already advanced the input there, but, you know, data is sort of keeping track with us. So at um, one comma one, some other, you know, I guess apparently zero, zero, zero went away. We had two copies of one 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 and a one more copy of two two two. Just trying to make things interesting. Uh, we advanced our wall clock time, so we sort of ticked the ones forward to two, so that we can now ask about um, one comma one, and we get what I think are the correct updated answers. So there are four different things we're talking about now because zero zero is totally gone uh, at, at one comma one. There are two things that occur once: that's the threes and the fours and one and, and two occur three and two times, uh, respectively. So that's good. You know, we sort of, we've updated the data once, we've looked at it. Um, this isn't, to be honest, this isn't very different from a standard stream processor. Things have sort of moved forward uh, as, as we would have hoped, to be totally honest. Um, but there are a few cute things that we can do uh, at the moment. So we asked about the current state of affairs, one comma one, right? We can also still go back and say, well, what did we, what do we know at zero, zero? Where uh, you know we've seen the answer for that before. Hopefully the answer hasn't changed because uh, this is um, deterministic computation, and we're not actually uh, ever going to be allowed to edit the past in the sense of changing what we've seen, right? Changing an answer that we've already received. So you know, the number at time zero zero that's locked down. That's done. Um, you know, we might be able to change data time zero in the future, our future, um, but zero zero is done. Um, some other things are done, which is sort of interesting. Uh, zero 05 is done. So what, is, what does zero 05 even mean? We haven't seen any event data 5 stuff. How could we possibly have any opinion on that? And the answer is that um, we can still answer the question of, at our time 0, what did we think was going to happen at 5? Right. So this is not um, you know, a high confidence statement about what will happen uh, at the data's time 5. This is sort of like saying, you know, at noon on election day, who do we think is going to win? Well, you know, we can look at the data now and say, if if this is it, if we don't get any more changes, this is what we expect. Uh, how do we expect the evening will close? Uh, and absolutely, we should not have a particularly high confidence uh, in this. But but we can extrapolate from the current state of affairs and say, you know, if, if no additional changes happen, this is what the number would look like. Um, we can scrub around in the past a little bit. Uh, this is maybe a slightly non-standard time, which is uh, you, just up above we were asking about 1 comma 1, which is, you know, as of right now for us, what does the data look like right now? Um, and um, yeah, sort of like, you know, as of noon, how many votes are there uh, you know, where people voted as of noon? Like maybe we're really up to date early in the day, that'd be great. But we can also walk back a little bit and say, well, you know, as of right now, um, what did things look like at the start of day, maybe, um, with respect to you know, people you know, in the first hour of voting or something like that. And none of these, sorry, all, these aren't particularly interesting, this, this example, but you can sort of scrub around a little bit in the past and ask these sorts of questions. And of course, um, you're obviously more than welcome to uh, check out sort of the current state of affairs as well. So, uh, so we've kept these things around that have allowed us to answer questions about 
sort of what uh, you know, what do we know, when do we know it, sorts of things. Uh, go back in our personal past to ask when did we first learn something about the world around us and how it has changed, which is the second dimension. So here's two other changes we can make, which I, I label them as sort of two weirder changes, but uh, the interpretation of these is going to be uh, a little weirder, yeah. So our input capability is currently at 2 comma 0. So both of these are legit changes that we can make. I'm going to remove a copy of 1, 1 at 2 comma 0. And I'll have to justify that in just a moment. And we'll add a copy of 3, 3 at 2 comma 4. Um, now, we're here sitting at, at our time 2 whatever. The heck am I doing going and changing 2 comma 0? That's the past, right? Like We've already seen 1 comma 1 stuff. So we've already heard information about uh, the data time one, and um, well, you know, we're still allowed to provide changes at, at two comma zero. One one is definitely locked down. Um, you know, we've moved from one to two our time, and we can start talking if we want now about things in the past. Uh, the data's past, so two comma zero is a totally fine time to go and um, retract one comma one. This is just revising data essentially. Um, you know, we might learn in the next hour coming up, that data that we thought was the case an hour ago uh, wasn't right, and some things had to change. It's a little weird to see some subtractions in the vote county example, I agree, but, uh, but you know, arbitrary changes uh, are allowed. We'd like to look at this, but we, you know, we can't look at it until we go and advance the, uh, the input forward to 3 comma 0, because you know, we need to move past the 2s if we want to see what's going on at 2. But having done that, we can actually walk through two comma each of the times. So we can say, what do things look like now at two, uh, two comma zero, which is sort of, given our most current information, how did things start out at, at zero? And this used to be a five, right? There used to be uh, five things that had count of one, and, and apparently, with our most current information, actually they could start with four. Uh, this, this change cascades through, like, um, you know, two comma one, we go and look at now, and 2 comma 1 has two things with a, a count of 1 and two things with a count of 2. That is different than uh, 1 comma 1, you can sort of see up here. So just a moment ago, at 1 comma 1, uh, we thought, so just a moment ago, we thought that at time 1 there should be you know, something with a count of 3. Right? And um, nothing actually changed uh, at 1, right? Uh, nothing changed at 2 comma 1. A thing changed at two comma zero that changes this answer, and we need to make sure that that change at two comma zero cascades through um, through the history, essentially, so that everything is uh, correct when we go and look at it. And we can sort of keep repeating this. We want two comma two. Uh, maybe interestingly, I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, we can start asking about two comma three. This is sort of the same way that we asked about zero comma five, right? Like, um, you know, if we're uh, if the user time is at two like our perceived time is at 2. We don't really think 3 is done yet. That's fine. Um, but we can still say, what, what's this going to look like if nothing else changes? And at 3, nothing's interesting has happened. But at uh, 2, comma 4, uh, something, something has happened. Because we did get advance notice, for some reason, up here, that um, at some particular time, uh, sorry, data time 4, there was a, an uptick that, that should happen. Not necessarily the last thing we're going to hear about data time four, but we have been alerted to the fact at, at our time two that at data time four something something goes and increases. And this you know this isn't necessarily problematic. It's a bit weird to like hear about the future, but there are various reasons. You know, someone might have planned a transaction that's you know you, when, you, when you sign a check for example, you could uh, post date it for example. So it's only it's going to become valid in the future. Uh, so you know we can know things that might happen in the future, we can still amend them too. Um, so your, your bank account balance might, uh, uh, the bank might learn something about your account balance that hasn't happened yet, but is planned to happen. And that might be super useful for your financial planning, or something like that. All right. So we, um, we asked these series of questions, 2 comma 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. They were essentially saying, given our current information, what do we know about um, the history of the data. So we're sort of looking at a timeline of the data, saying, you know, tell me the most current 
uh, history of all this, this data. We can also look in a different dimension, right? So we've seen something weird happened at four here. It's totally reasonable to ask what the heck went on with four. Like, let's look at that time and see how our understanding of that time has evolved over time. So we could say, tell me about zero comma four, where you know, back in early days, we we're like, yeah, there should be five things there, right? Uh, we have those zero, zero, one, one, two, two, three, three, and four, four. They're all, uh, you know, w when we sort of woke up in the morning, that's what we were expecting we would find at uh, data time four. Now, that evolved, of course. And after our first round uh, of updates, our, the user time advancing through one, uh, this changed. Uh, if you recall, the, the zero went away. We got some more ones and twos. Everything looked uh, you know, much more exciting. I guess you know, you'd say one pulled ahead or something like that. Um, yeah, I guess in the voting analogy, think of four maybe as I don't know, midnight or something like that. And, you know, how did our predictions change? And uh, But currently, for whatever reason, um, well, for several reasons that we, that we uh, affected ourselves, at two comma four, we're looking and we're seeing that, you know, a whole bunch of people, three people have a count of two, um, which I, I believe are, uh, yeah, one, two, and three, and then four is sitting there with just a count of one. So this gives us a, a different view through the data where we hold one dimension fixed, you know, some moment of time in the data, and try to see how it's evolved. So uh, y you might be able to imagine that um, this is totally tractable because you just record all of those updates at all of their times. Anytime anyone has a question, you scrub through the entire past and try to figure out what changes apply. And, and you're right, that's, that's essentially what we've done so far. So if we look under the covers in differential data flow, it has been um, tracking all of these, these changes, it hasn't thrown away anything yet. And arguably that's uh, a, a bad call. I mean, it's, it's cool to have this power, but um, yeah, at some point we're gonna we're gonna run out of, um, you know, things will keep changing, 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 changing. We're gonna run out of memory, or it's gonna become really slow to ask these questions because we might have to scrub through a whole bunch of different changes just to figure out the answer at a particular point in time. So, um, we, you know, we've just seen that we've asked questions like, you know, 0, 4, 1, 4, 2, 4, which showed us all of this nice historical detail at every moment in the past. One thing we're allowed to do, though, uh, is remove our ability to ask some of these questions in the interest of improved computer performance, um, reduced memory use. And the advanced output command is the one that, that does that here. And this is the one that says, hmm, I used to be able to answer questions about any time that's in the future of zero comma zero. That's all times, basically, um, except those negative ones we saw. But, but we've now gone and advanced the output to, to one zero. What does that do? That means that if we ask questions like, tell me about zero comma four, we'll, we'll get a message back from the system that basically says, take a hike. Um, you know, zero four is not available. Essentially, we've lost the ability to distinguish between zeros and ones in our time. Right? We've, we've said, since no one's going to ask about zero comma anything anymore, you know, anything that happened at zero something, feel free to pretend it happened at one comma something. Um, you know, we, we, don't, we don't need to be able to see the difference between those two times anymore. And uh, we, we still do, we do have, oops, we do have the ability to correctly get all of our queries from one comma anything, two comma anything, um, and, you know, if we wanted to, we could advance to 2 comma 0. Uh, that would roll up the data even more. This gives us a little bit of view into the back. But this, essentially, the, the important point here is that this is something that you can control. Um, so rather than have it baked into your program, for example, how much history gets kept, you can sort of interactively decide, um, what do I need to be able to answer questions about? And uh, that can be super handy because your, your needs can change and the fact that the system sort of stays tight with whatever your expressed needs are is super handy. All right, um, let's see. There's some other things that uh, we we might worry about or or ask questions about. So, so right now we've when we've been advancing our input capabilities, uh, it's been a while, but when we look at advanced input, for example, we've been ticking forward our uh, user timestamp. So the first the first time sent there, you know, 0, 1, 2, uh, 3, I guess down here, sorry, 3 down here. But we've left the data timestamp at 0. Um, we've essentially said that the data can 
perform uh, you know, in a sense arbitrary historical revision. No matter what time that first coordinate gets to, if there's a zero in the second coordinate, then uh, we can just go back and change change the past arbitrarily. And that can be really handy. Um, that can be exactly what you want. Uh, if, if you're never sure that you won't receive an arbitrary modification back in the past, you should probably uh, just keep zeros there in that, that data timestamp. You need to be able to supply data timestamps of zero to, to change you know, like the initial uh, the initial state of, of the data. Uh, feel free. Um, that will, of course, uh, consume some memory, right? Like if you're keeping the whole history of the data, you're going to need to um, keep all of those times differentiated. Uh, but maybe that's important. So I don't want to tell you you shouldn't do it. But you can totally go through and try to lock down the past. So um, this often, uh, I mean, you, you see this a lot in, in the wild. And this is not usually a user who says, I'm locking down the past so much as at various points. Uh, let's take the voting example again. Various districts can announce themselves as complete, right? They might say, we've got everything for you. Um, or potentially, you know, we've reported everyone who voted up through noon, for example. Like, we've taken all of the timestamp votes that occurred up through noon, and you've seen all of those. Like that's a legit thing for the data provider to say. And they might say that we're not going to tell you, uh, we're not going to show you any more events that happened with a timestamp that's not greater than or equal to noon. Uh, we're not going to sort of roll back the clock there. And the analogous way that you do that here is just through this command. And, and again, relatively rarely is this a user typing this, this command, but I'm running the demo in addition to uh, narrating the story here. So we, we did an advanced input where instead of 3, comma 0, we said 3, comma 2, um, which is a way of saying you know, the future changes we might supply, well, they'll need to be 3 or greater in the user dimension um, and 2 or greater in the, uh, in the data dimension. And what does that do? Well, that means that if we try to go and update the data in the past, three comma zero, uh, we'll get told, no, take a hike. Um, you can't do that. That time is locked down. You don't have permission to do that anymore. And the system in particular may have already told people uh, correct answers for, uh, uh, with confidence for times like you know, three comma zero. Um, to be honest, it might have also told them times four comma zero. Four hasn't happened yet from our point of view. But the system is smart enough to realize, like, look, you, you're not allowed to change time zero, data time zero, now or tomorrow or, or anything. You know, you, you've locked down. You've promised that you're done with time zero and time one, to be totally honest. Um, so you know, no, you don't get to change that. Um, does not limit our ability to make changes to uh, times like three comma four just because that's, you know, uh, 3, 4 is in the future of 3, comma 2. It's a totally, totally legit change to make. And, you know, if we wanted to then go and look and see what happened there, we could advance the input, uh, our uh, input from 3 to 4, our, uh, our user time coordinate. Now, why would you do that? Uh, that seems like that's just giving up abilities, right? Like, why not just always keep your capabilities at 0? And um, yeah, again, you might want that. Uh, let me show you what you can do if you, if you don't do that, though. If you're able to realize that some of your data are complete through certain times, you can issue queries which look a bit mental at first, right? So uh, I'm going to do a query at 10,000, comma, 0. And 10,000 is, you know, we're, we're still at 4, comma, what? 4, comma, 2 or something like that. 10,000, comma, 0 is way in our future. But we can, at this point, already report the exact correct answer for 10,000 comma zero. And the reason is because we know that all of the blah comma zero timestamps, uh, the data have been locked down for those, right? We supplied some for sure, and then we gave up the ability to send uh, new inputs at data time zero. So uh, we can actually issue this sort of query and get a concrete answer back, um, totally correct, saying that, you know, essentially think of 10,000 as like at the end of time. So no matter how long we run this program for, um, the data time zero answer is going to end up at four. Um, it might have changed, you know, as, as we go zero, zero, one, zero, two, zero, three, zero, wobbles a little bit. But uh, by the end of the computation, it will end up as four. We are, we are certain about that. Uh, and this is a great way. This is basically the structure of a query that says, hey, don't tell me the answer until 
we're sure that it's correct. Like, feel free to take your time, do some of that speculative query answering stuff, give me, you know, partial information that we've gotten so far. But this query, you know, if I put a really big number in that first thing, like think positive infinity, essentially, in that first thing, and then a specific, like zero in this case, but a specific time in that the data coordinate, I want the correct final answer for the, the data time. And this is very much like the question of tell me the votes in, in the election as of data time midnight at the night of the election. And, uh, you know, for the, for the user time, I don't, you know, the year uh, uh, 2099 or something like that, like uh, it can be an arbitrary time in the future of vote revisions. Tell me what the revisions will end up being. Like when, once everything's been certified, right? What were those totals? So, uh, th and this is a, the ability you get only because someone went and advanced the input and said, I'm done with time zero. Um, so, although we've been allowed to screw around sort of arbitrarily here um, in the past, we can now also, uh, while still screwing around with other times, make clear unqualified statements about correct answers of things uh, that, that have finished. And, you know, we can do this with some other times. Here's the final answer for uh, data time one. Um, you know, this, this would be the same if, if we did uh, 20,000, 100,000, all those sorts of things. And we can ask about the final answer for data time two. And we, oh, we get a complaint back that um, can't tell you, it's still open. Um, you know, the timely data flow is able to see, we still have a capability for something comma two. So, um, Something, something less than 10,000 comma two. Um, if we were at 40,000 comma two, we could have answered, sorry, yeah, 40,000 comma two, uh, we, could, we could have answered this query, but, um, but essentially it's saying that you're not done with, with time two yet. We could be done with time two, like let's, let's check that out. So we could say, okay, look, nothing's changed. Um, we've, we've finished with time two. We'll tell you about threes from now on. And uh, now we can go and get a correct answer for, uh, for data time two. All the while, right, uh, also having incorrect, well, incorrect, but like, you know, partial answers for other times that are, that are coming up. So that's, that's what happens when you take our, uh, our user time and sort of drive it off to essentially to infinity and ask questions about it and get answers back. You can do the flip thing with uh, users, uh, sorry, what's the right this? You can pick a, a particular user time and ask about um, yeah, unboundedly large data time. Do -do. Uh, I guess this is the same, that's sort of boring. But what, what this is asking essentially is at, at our user time three, how do we think this ends? Like, you know, play forward the, uh, the computation through all of the event times and tell me like, you know, as of right now, how, I don't know, how many people voted, let's say in the election, it doesn't matter um, uh, when or anything like that, just count everything up for me and uh, t tell me what the answers are there. We expect that to change, but this, this you know, rather than worrying about any particular moment in the, the history of events that have come through, this tells us uh, where we think everything ends. And sometimes that's interesting, sometimes that's it's not super interesting. Um, the election analogy, there isn't a particularly uh, good one because there's a very crisp moment in the data time where we're supposed to look but for other sorts of computations you might be interested to uh, uh, see where things are you know if things are predicted to quiesce and sort of quiet down see where they where they end up yeah and that's mostly what I have uh, there's like some final bit of cleanup that I want to do here which is um, we uh, have been able to ask questions all over the place um, you might recall that um, advanced output to like one comma zero at one point. If I'm brave enough to go and advance the output to four comma three, this removes my ability to ask questions now of, at times like, um, well, you can no longer ask about um, 10,000 comma two uh, because we've rolled up zero, one, and two into three. Right, we've sort of said, uh, like in the election case, you know, we've lost the minute by minute reports from the previous hours, uh, and we can sort of see what's current from three going forward. But in the interest of you know, only keeping bounded amounts of data, 
things are, uh, well, essentially, we've, we're giving up the ability to look at fine historical detail. And just to sort of sketch, uh, I don't actually have some data for this, but like a totally reasonable pattern now is um, repeatedly having advanced outputs that, you know, roughly, oops, yeah. go away. Um, do a laptop with a touch bar at the top that that is really excited to be to be touched and brings up new windows. Uh, just yeah, looking over here on the on the left hand side, a really not uncommon pattern is real time continues. Maybe I should force this forward. Uh, real time continues to to march forward, and the event times, uh, the data times, eh, track it. You know, like they're they're usually a, a bit behind because like, of course you you don't know the instantaneous. Uh, correct answer for a thing because there's a little bit of time for information to get from wherever it was sourced to you but things track you know somewhat close and differential data flow needs to keep uh, live the diffs uh, sort of in the the gap between these things it'd be great if it was five comma five six comma six seven comma seven it's not going to be that um, but you know a little bit of gaps uh, between the two is a little bit more than you'd have to do with just one time dimension, but it gives you the ability to absorb the, the slack essentially between these two two different dimensions. Keep track of what you actually know for certain versus what you happen to know right now and suspect might be true about the future, but but haven't quite gotten the specific information yet. Cool, and that's all I've got for you right now. This is a bit of a longer discussion than I necessarily expected, but um, this, this code, multi-temporal.rs, will be up in the differential data flow repo. It's uh, a thing that I, this isn't, I don't think, great fun uh, to pull down, just play with and see what you can do with it. But it's the sort of thing that might uh, give you a little bit of insight if you try it out to say like, you know, would it make sense to think of this particular problem this way? Like, you know, I, I do hotel reservations. Uh, what if all of my events are in the future, right? It's like. We're, we're really talking about reserving things in the future, and at any point in time, I want to see, do I have any rooms left in my hotel? Something like that. Um, very different than the, the data time lagging behind real time. It's generally in the future, and perhaps you don't take reservations for, uh, you know, this moment it has to be for uh, the next day or something like that. And you can play around with that in here, and I, I believe that probably all works just fine. Um, but you can sort of get a sense for, for what things look like, and. Um, of course, you know, you could dangle a much more interesting computation here rather than just counting things. Originally, there was a graph reachability computation, and even just trying to determine if we had a correct answer was, uh, was exhausting. But yeah, uh, arguably one of the cool things about differential data flow is that instead of count and map, um, you can put an arbitrary, not just aggregation, but arbitrary computation in their joins, uh, iterative computation, mutual recursive, blah, blah, uh, and the multi-temporal nature of it's pushed through the entire data flow. So when you look at the outputs, you're getting the correct answers as of each of these times, which um, I, don't know, I think is really cool, or it, you know is untapped in terms of uh, people interacting with multi-temporal data. But I'm going to stop there. I uh, hope this has been interesting. If it has, great. Uh, feel free to you know reach out, say so. Um, and you know I guess if not, let me know. Also, uh, that's totally fine too. And uh, we're going to wind up with that. Thank you very much.